you know, actors only have to think about their one role. Composers have to think about the entire picture. And um, I can't not give empathy to someone just because I don't like them if it's not serving the story. Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, which is brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be hearing from film composer Sultana Isham. Sultana grew up playing the violin and continued studying it through college at Syracuse University. But it is when she moved to New Orleans that a range of new musical possibilities opened up for her. You see, Sultana is also an avid researcher, and one of her passions has always been the people's history and culture of Creolite throughout the Americas and abroad. So you can understand why New Orleans, that hub of Creole culture, appealed to her. Once there, she started playing with Les Sennel, an ensemble devoted to Creole folk music and works by composers of color. She also began to write her own pieces, and in 2017, she put out her first EP, Blood Moon, a mixture of avant-garde classical and pop fusion. That attracted the attention of director Zandashe Brown, who hired her to write the score for the horror short Blood Runs Down and Sultana's career as a film composer was thus launched. By the way, the music you're currently hearing is Sultana's just-released soundtrack for another horror short directed by Zandashe Brown titled Benedictions. Director Angela Tucker hired her to be both researcher and composer on the documentary All Skin Folk Ain't Kin Folk, a PBS documentary about a historic New Orleans mayoral race between two black women, Among Sultana's other credits are The Neutral Ground, which also aired on PBS and received an Emmy nomination for Best Historical Documentary, and the PBS series Making Black America, narrated by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. I started the interview by asking Sultana why and how she first decided to start adventuring beyond the classical music world in which she had been trained. You know, the classical world, the classical tradition where I come from, I always felt, this is just my experience, and I know people can relate to this, but my experience was that the goal was not necessarily about expressing myself. It was about precision and being correct and, you know, continuing a tradition. And, and, you know, I was judged based on how accurate my performances were And also being a good team player, because when you're playing an orchestra, it's not about just one person. So, you know, I was always growing up in group projects, you know. There's a lot of beauty and skill and discipline from that training that has definitely influenced every aspect of my life, and I'm so grateful for it. But the idea of being an artist, the idea of expressing myself was not, it was not presented as a legitimate desire. It was, like I said, it was just about being correct. Um, It wasn't until after school I was able to start to find myself, my voice, and um, explore the feral power of sound. So, Oh, okay. I like that. The feral power of sound. (laughs) And you also talked about breaking out. So let's talk about feral things and breaking out. uh, How did that happen? You know, so many things. So I live in New Orleans. I've been here for 10 years. This is my 10th year of living here. Um, my godparents are, my, in Creole we say Parian and Nana, they're both from Lafayette, Louisiana. So I've always thought of this region as like my god city, my god home. Oh, so you had visited there a lot growing up? Not a lot, but I just always known about my godparents who are from Lafayette, um, Louisiana. It's a very old town community is sort of like everybody knows each other when I tell people who you know my godparents are people you know know who they are just by names because you know their names are so old so I've always just 
known about it, but I think also in relation to that and my breaking out, but also incorporating the things that I did learn in the academy. Like my first year of college, I remember you know, we all had to take a world music class. And um, in that class was my first time seeing, like in an academic setting, not like just ever, but in an academic setting was my first time ever seeing um, the topic of Creole folk tunes come up, the topic of, you know, works composed by um, Black people or enslaved people or folk music, and that being the bones of, you know, Black classical composers that have come after them. That was my first time being exposed to that. It was my first time also seeing something that resembled me. From there, from 18 and that moment, I started on my own to just like learn more about um, the Creole diaspora, Creole Ate, um, the linguistic dexterity and the cultural plasticity of this region. What what was it specifically about that music and that Creole Ate that really appealed to you? It just felt really familiar to me, honestly. It started as just like a s- earnest, like, oh, um, there's something that sounds familiar to me. I, I wasn't sure. I was like, did I hear this before? And I'm like, like, it just felt familiar. I couldn't put my finger on it. And at that time, I like at 18, I really didn't have anyone to talk to about this. Um, so it was something that was just always very private for me. And I didn't really feel like the people around me were curious about it. So it didn't really make a great environment for conversation and dialogue to, you know, prosper. Um, But until I came to New Orleans, that's when I was able to form community with people. And through that, it just exposed more pieces, more music, more stories, more migration patterns, more connections to other locations. Like all of those things was being revealed to me. What did you develop your scholarship practice? Clearly you you dived headfirst into deep research. Yes. Is that something you had to train yourself in? You mentioned you had a mentor. I have a few mentors. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have a few. It takes a village, right? So yeah. hmm, well, you know, in school, like again, like we have, you know, we are we've been trained to to do that. But it, the focus was on different people, different region. But even from that region, like I'm a huge Ravel fan. I'm a huge, huge fan of his work and his story. But he is someone who is quoted constantly honoring jazz musicians, Black musicians, Black classical musicians. You know, he traveled to New Orleans. He traveled to New York. And he actually even gave a lecture at Rice University Um, when he was here, and it deeply influenced, you know, the tradition of Black music deeply influenced his later works. Another person, Dvorak, is another major one he um, is known for, you know, when most of us are practicing Bach pieces. So, you know, um, he was practicing that, and but before that, spirituals, Negro spirituals. So learning of like a mutual relationship between these genres and these worlds. So for me, it was like, I was really interested in that. My education did not teach me that. My education, the academy didn't, they were focusing on something else. So I think because like, this is the world I come from and this is the music that I love and this is the tradition that I grew up in, I just knew that there were parts of me that was not being included and there retelling of this history. So it was honestly just me looking for myself. When did you first start describing yourself as an ethnomusicologist? I I started, call, well, ethnomusicologists started calling me that. So <laughs> I was like, That's okay, a well. a of honor. That's cool. <laughs> exactly. I, I, you know, like they started calling me that and including my work in their classes and things like that. So um, it gave me like a sense of permission And also just like, oh, I know what I'm doing, you know, and speaking at different conferences and things like that. Because I was also, a lot of my work is interrogating the social conditions that were present at the time of these compositions. And also sonic migration patterns and just looking at um, even their construction of their idea of what was race or gender and how instruments 
Um, D. Antoinette Handy is a major inspiration of mine, another musicologist. She um, talks a lot about in her work about how instruments were gendered, um, the history of how women in particular were encouraged to or limited to voice and piano, mostly to pursue like feminine ideals, not necessarily an earnest artistic pursuit. Yeah, it was just like, honestly, like finding other people like myself, learning different things. And like, you know, they would point me in certain directions. I would point them in certain directions. And we all memorialized the sounds together. All this time you were playing and also speaking at conferences. It sounds to me like you were primed to get a doctorate in this. Was that ever a temptation? People keep saying that. (laughs) (laughs) People keep saying that. Um, I mean, I definitely work with a lot of institutions and I have a few things in the works that I can, we can talk about in a bit. But I think in the beginning, I was just like, really, because, okay, so in New Orleans, my, how my performance practice sort of started, um, New Orleans is very like jazz centered, you know, Mm -hmm. so woodwind, brass, like, you know, they dominate. Being a string player is like kind of exotic to them, even though historically speaking, the first opera houses in the Western Hemisphere were in Louisiana, we're in New Orleans. Integrated orchestras, there's a very beautiful, extensive history of multiracial orchestras, Black orchestras, um, opera houses singing in multiple languages. The first ones were in New Orleans. So they have a very beautiful, long classical history that people don't really talk about that much. But anyway... Um, to get work, you know, at as a 20, at the time, 22-year-old that had just moved here, trying to get work, I had to incorporate other genres. At the time, I just wanted to, like, do my work and just explore music. So I started playing at different artist residencies and hotels and things like that. At that time, people were just so censored in being entertained. Um, so I was like, you know, incorporating things that I liked. I'm a huge Grace Jones fan. So in the beginning of my like performance career here in New Orleans, I used to do Grace Jones tributes on the violin. And I would also play my own stuff and a little bit of Bach and things like that. But it was I was trying to figure myself out. I was trying to figure out what did I want to say. You know, the performance etiquette and... Uh, like a jazz or pop world is so different from the classical world, you know, like in the pop or jazz, like they want more conversation. They want more engagement. You know, I grew up never talking, rarely talking to the audience. You know, it was very cut and dry. You stand at this point, they applaud, you bow, you know, you read your music, you play. There was no like expectation for me to talk to my audience. So I, you know, it was like kind of hard for me to do that in the beginning, but I learned how to do it. But at the same time, I was like, this wasn't sustainable for me at the time. And I just wanted to focus on more heart-centered work. I wanted to focus on work that was bigger than me as an individual. I wanted to support and uplift stories that were bigger than me as an individual that could be a catalyst for, you know, change and memory collections and things like that. So I just started diving more into my scholarship and and um, I attracted different opportunities. Tell me about your first film score. My first film score was a Southern Gothic horror film um, <gasps> called... Horror, that's hard. Har- There's no other genre that relies on a score as heavily as horror. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's my favorite genre, so... I-, <laughs> I love it too, I love it too. <laughs> so wait, so your first, your first score was for a horror film, what was it? It was called Blood Runs Down, directed by Xander Shea Brown. You know, it was very interesting. It was my first experience of seeing how supporting this, like a story like this can be like a mirror to my own life. So like the film was exploring like mental illness and generational trauma between mother and daughter. And the mother in the film was schizophrenic. And um, the director, her mom is schizophrenic and my grandmother was schizophrenic so it brought up a lot for me as I was making it and then I when I finished the score my grandmother died and the film has like a similar ending so it was like really gnarly for me to like be in that kind of experience but it taught me 
so much about the power of empathy and it really has influenced every other film I've done since. Could you describe a documentary project that you scored and how you went about doing the research and, and as you said, serving the story? Yeah. Okay. So a really good one, it kind of brings all of these things together, even horror. So my first feature film is um, The Neutral Ground, directed by C.J. Hunt. Um, and it is about the removal of Confederate monuments. And it premiered at Tribeca and we got an Emmy nomination. It was like a really good thing for us all. There's this one scene in the film where it's about the United Daughters of the Confederate Confederacy and how these women, these widows who lost their husbands and sons in the Civil War, how they erected these monuments to memorialize their loved ones who were killed. So I had to write a choral piece. That was the objective. The director wanted me to write a choral piece for little girls. And um, I had never written a choral piece at the time. And he wanted the text to be in Latin specifically. So this is where like scholarship and horror for me was able to come together because I told him for me, I saw that scene in particular as a horror scene. I think of white supremacy as horror. I don't think of it as like, that's how I think of it. That's how I see it, at least especially in an artistic way. Um, I definitely see it that way. I think it's effective to have it in that way. And also, it's kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of a horror trope in scoring. The sound of a girl singing can be terrifying. Yes, sometimes. it can. In, it in can a be, certain context, right? Definitely. It's used that way, yeah. Definitely, and it, it was for the scene. So where did you find your Latin text? So the text came from a motto that the Confederacy used to chant. And their motto was um, Deo Vindice, which means like God will vindicate us, something like that. And I added the word alibi because I saw that they were using their religion as an alibi to for their violence, um, like using that as a shield to like keep doing what they're doing, causing all this mess and war and dehumanization, but in the name of their God, which is like horrible thing to do. So um, the text was basically that statement that they used to chant, Deo Vindice, and, but little girls singing it. I remember putting it in D minor, I believe. And I, ha- I hired a choir from the West Los Angeles Children's Choir. This is still in the pandemic. I mean, this is still during lockdown. So um, I sent them the score and the director sent the score to the children And I think they all recorded it separately and um, sent me back an amazing recording. And I've had many people, and I think they are people who are descendant of these, you know, women who were passing down this lie. And they all have told me that they've had a cellular response to that particular scene. So it made me feel like as a composer, I did my job. And it was also like a lesson in building empathy for a group of people that would not have empathy for me. Because, you know, like we have to hold all these different stories as a composer. You know, actors only have to think about their one role. Composers have to think about the entire picture. And um, I can't not give empathy to someone just because I don't like them if it's not serving the story. It's clear to me that you're, as they say, it's it's so cliche to say, but a self-starter. And you made your own opportunities. But looking back at your artistic career as you were coming up, is there anything that could have been changed, whether in your education or employment opportunities, that could have made your work easier? So many things, I feel. But I think with my perspective, I just think of all of those challenges as ingredients and as like a fuel for me to do what I'm doing. Who knows if I would have been doing what I was, what I'm doing if those challenges weren't present. Um, who knows if I would have had the drive to create this lane for myself. So, I mean, I could say, yeah, it would have been great to learn about these, you know, different composers of my lineage in school. That would have been great to learn. That would have given me a certain level of confidence at such a young age. That because would've... you just had, did you only have that one world music class? Yeah, that was my okay. only 
That was my only time. But I grew up, like I knew people, I knew people, like I knew the first black person to ever be in the Virginia Symphony growing up. Like his daughter and my mom taught at the same school. Like there is a group of black classical musicians in my hometown that like gave out scholarships. You know, I received a scholarship, you know, I've received a four year one that got me through my college career. Um, So like, you know, I knew, like I had resources. I just wish I had like more of a personal relationship with it, um, with that particular thing. But I think it came the time that it was supposed to come, honestly. I don't have any regrets. Um, I think we can always make systems better. And I think a, a, a concrete one that I could think of is that it would have been awesome to learn some of the tech stuff and music school. Cause you know, they like the things like the tech stuff that I use, none of this was, none of this was taught to me in school. I kind of learned just by, you know, process, not really in school, like, you know, the technology aspect of it. Do you like, think it's it's probably taught now, maybe, you think? I think um, I think it just depends what you're majoring in, because there are music, there are film scoring programs, right? Right. But I was in a performance, you know, classical oh, performance programming, right. and I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about composition at that time. I was just thinking about being, you know, a violinist in an or- somebody's orchestra. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, goals, and I'm so glad that my goals have changed. I remember when I started to dive into, like, other genres, the highest I was dreaming was to be, like, a string version of Sheila E. Um, but, <laughs> you know, like, I was I was thinking too small. Which is kind of, that would be kind of an amazing thing to be, honestly, but, but that wasn't your thing. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool, but, like, no, not for me. Okay. <laughs> so... To the extent that you're comfortable talking about future yes. projects that you're excited about, can you yes. can you share some of them? Yes, definitely. So one that I am very excited for is I'm working on a planetarium opera based on the research of these celestial objects called brown dwarfs. And um, I'm working with my director and librettist, Janani Balasubramanian, and also a team of astrophysicists with the American Museum of Natural History in New York. How, wait, how did you make this happen? <laughs> so first off, always, I think the heart-based aspect is like following my curiosities. You know, like I was saying like for fun, I took a science class at Duke. For fun, I was reading all these physics and science books. All of that was for fun. I didn't have like an agenda under, I was just like curious about a topic and I just wanted to learn more about it. Um, And then it just started to naturally just influence my work and my scholarship and my presentations. So fast forward like a year, well, in 2020, I got into my first fellowship at Sundance for film composers. And then the following year, I got into my next one for interdisciplinary artists. And there was a huge cohort of interdisciplinary artists, whether they were in dramatur- dramaturgists or um, composers. We had an in-person residency program for a select few of us. Like we had different options that we could choose from. And I chose one in Wyoming um, called U-Cross. And that's where I met my collaborator in person. And they are like an artist scientist as well. And they heard me speaking somewhere and they were like, <gasps> you know, like the light bulb went and they were like, I think this is the composer for this project that I want to do. So tell me what what's operatic about brown dwarfs? So brown dwarfs are celestial objects that blur the lines between what makes a planet a planet and what makes a star a star. So sort of like how it's just like there's so many parallels that are being made with just this object's experience. And there's also a lot of play with darkness and light because these objects are only visible under the infrared. And they were just discovered in 1994. This is like kind of recent scholarship. So the opera is going to be a planetarium opera. So it's written for dome-shaped cinema. So um, there's going to be like recorded, maybe with some pre-recorded and live elements, different voice techniques, and also incorporating instruments that are not always included in the symphonic families. So, you know, like these objects blur the lines and they break the rules between these different genres and categories. 
So the piece, the intention of the piece is to also be in that ethos. And then you mentioned an HBO series? Yes. So um, simultaneously, um, while I was working on this, when I met my collaborator, this was two years ago, um, I was in the queue to work on this mini series for HBO um, that I got. It's about Sax Records, the record label company in Memphis, Tennessee, and you know, which housed all those giants like Otis Redding and Isaac Hayes and the Barkey, like so many amazing, amazing, amazing musicians. And I did that series with my director, Jamila Wignol. We actually did a documentary on Alvin Ailey, um, which was technically my first Sundance premiere. Um, I did the additional music for that film. And so we did, we worked together again for this, where I'm like, I'm the main composer, I'm the only composer for Stax, um, Soulville, USA. And we just got, it was just announced that we got into South by Southwest. So nice. we'll be premiering at South by Southwest on March 10th. And it will be broadcasting on HBO, um, I think they say in May, end of May. And it's a four part docuseries. To learn more about Sultana and read a written version of the interview, please head to uncsa.edu slash artrestart. If you enjoyed this episode, won't you please share it with a friend? And please be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified as soon as our next interview is ready for you. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts, Thank you for listening.